Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Musgrave. It's May 26, 2009. We're in the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, and I have the honor and privilege to interview Mr. James H. Falk for the Richard Nixon Oral History Program. Mr. Falk, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. And we've been talking off camera a little bit about your, uh, your trip to China um, in early 74. Um, so why don't we talk about the trip itself for just a bit, and then we'll talk about the uh, meeting in Memphis where all of this starts to come together. Good. Uh, Paul, interestingly, when um, I first heard about the possibility of a, of a China trip, uh, Dr. Kissinger had come back from one of his trips to China with an invitation for a group of provincial officials from the U.S. to, uh, to tour China. And they uh, wanted actually a group of, of uh, uh, our governors, which they referred to as the provincial officials, uh, to get out in the countryside and actually see the country. Uh, the prior four, three prior delegations that had gone after President Nixon's visit and Dr. Kissinger's several visits, uh, those were congressional visits that went primarily to Peking and back. Um, our visit actually was then set, set up or scheduled to go uh, to Shanghai, to then Beijing or Peking, and then out to uh, the, the the far reaches of the west of China to uh, Shoshan, where Chairman Mao was born, <clears throat> to uh, Hangzhou, where Chairman Mao had a private resort, uh, and to uh, Changsha, uh, places that had not been visited for 50-plus uh, years uh, by any Westerner. So we were uh, breaking completely new ground, and it was quite exciting. Who was with you on the trip? We took a, a bipartisan delegation of governors, three Republicans and three Democrats. Uh, the chairman of the Democratic governors, Calvin Rampton of Utah, was the, the uh, uh, leader of the delegation. Uh, Governor Dan Evans of, of Washington was the Republican leader. Um, there was also Governor Mandel uh, from Maryland and, and Governor Arch Moore from uh, West Virginia. And on the uh, Republican side, there was, uh, uh, in addition to uh, Governor Dan Evans, there was uh, Governor Bob Ray of Iowa. And several of the governors were able to take their wives as well. So Governor Ray took his wife, uh, Governor Evans took his wife, um, as did uh, um, Arch Moore. So. Yeah, I'm just curious, I don't know if we've talked about this at all, but uh, did Governor Carter get an invitation? Uh, Governor Carter did not get an invitation, and it wasn't uh, really uh, our selection. It, we, we left it to the national governors to uh, give us the three nominees, both the Republicans and three Democrats. Um, so we didn't want to uh, be accused of making any political judgments with respect to who the selectees were, um, but rather to get a broad base. I'm just asking because we were looking earlier at the list of governors in 74, and it was a pretty solid group. You had Ron Reagan and uh, Dale Bumpers and obviously Nelson Rockefeller, who we'll talk Precisely. a little bit uh, later. Precisely. Um, Memphis, 1973. Memphis, 1973, was, was uh, a, a watershed kind of meeting because uh, it was a meeting of the president with the Republican governors who were a particularly solid core group of supporters for him and for his legislative program. So we had uh, the, the Republican governor's leadership uh, wanting to meet with President Nixon and wanting to be supportive of revenue sharing and welfare reform and, and government reorganization uh, and all of the new federalism programs. Um, and we did, in fact, uh, meet with them, and it was um, during the height of Watergate and during the height of the Vietnam War. Um, so it was a particularly sensitive time from a political perspective. It was a particularly sensitive time from a perspective of domestic legislation. Uh, but there were all of these swirling issues uh, at the time as well. Uh, and, and that was really the backdrop of that meeting in Memphis. Um, the, uh, 
net net of that meeting was that the governor's passed a resolution of unqualified support for President Nixon, uh, and we're really out in front leading his uh, his support, notwithstanding the revelations that had been made about uh, uh, the Watergate tapes and, and uh, uh, other allegations that were floating around about Watergate at that time. But uh, the, the, the downside of the meeting was that the governors asked the president if there were any more bombshells. And President Nixon responded that there were none that he knew of at that time. Uh, and what happened was that uh, after the meeting concluded, and, and when we got back to the White House, we learned of the 18 and a half minute gap. And, and the governors then uh, felt that they had been let down by uh, not being told about that. Um, but we immediately then tried to, to let them know that we didn't know about that in advance of the meeting uh, and tried to uh, prevent there being any major political impact, but we were still attempting at that point to put together the China trip. Hmm. And, and we didn't want to have the whole thing blow up because of, of, uh, of that meeting. So it was a sensitive time. I'm going to pause here. I'm not quite sure what the noise oh, is. Water. That's what I'm thinking of this thing. I'm going to cross that. I'm just going to cross for a second. Because I looked at this and I thought it was off. There's not really any controls. Where does it sound? Well, I have a. Water. I think it's coming from back there. So you want to just poke your head out? Well, I'm going to stop here. Yeah. Okay, so we've uh, at least isolated that most mystery. I want to go back to the beginning when you join the Nixon administration uh, mm -hmm. because you are part of this group of Arizona lawyers who find themselves in Washington. And there's Dick Kleindienst, obviously, and uh, uh, Bill Rehnquist, who later goes on to some distinction, um, and Ed Morgan. Um, how do you get tapped to join the Nixon administration? Well, it's a very interesting question, and it was a, a great surprise to me. Uh, it all started with a, um, a, a project that I was working on with uh, a, a former Supreme Court justice in, in Arizona, uh, J. Mercer Johnson, who had been uh, a state court judge and a Supreme Court justice and, and had been asked to be special attorney general to handle the highway cases for the construction of the interstate highways. And he and I, uh, I was his assistant. We were working together, and we met with some of the people from the Attorney General's office, and they were talking about the, the, the Johnson administration grant programs that, that were making grants to various new entities to be created by the states. Uh, and they were concerned that those entities were being given uh, far too great uh, uh, enumerated powers. Uh, and... <clears throat> So we were asked to, to do a, a memorandum for the state legislature on the appropriateness of the grants of power to tax, for example, uh, that the Johnson administration program had, had started. Uh, we did, in fact, I, I wrote a, a legal memorandum on the, the, the power to tax delegation uh, stating that in Arizona it was unconstitutional for uh, non-elected public officials to impose a tax uh, and that uh, the legislation should not be passed in that form. Uh, I promptly forgot about that and six months later um, I was uh, surprised to read that the legislation had passed uh, and that uh, my wife got up on a Saturday morning and read the front page of the paper and there was a photograph of me. I had been appointed to this new statewide authority uh, which had been given the power to tax. Um, we had to then figure out how we were going to, to, to deal with this, and, and uh, it, it turns out that we had uh, a constitutional vehicle. We, we could uh, pass a tax that the governor wouldn't sign, and by constitutional law in Arizona would have original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court. Uh, so we then took the, the liberty of passing a tax with a dollar on everything in Arizona. Uh, then the governor rejected it. 
We sued the governor and the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court set it up for expedited hearing and argument and briefing, and, uh, and we won the case. So we eliminated the power to tax, yet sanctified the creation of the authority. And that became a widely discussed constitutional issue. And, and as a result, I, as a very young lawyer, um, not even 30 years old, was, was uh, uh, spoken of as a constitutional law expert. Uh, I kept denying that I was a constitutional law expert, but notwithstanding, the, the label stuck. Um, at that point, the Nixon administration was doing something that was 180 degrees different than what the Johnson administration had done. The Johnson administration, and, and President Johnson, like President Nixon, was a brilliant strategist and had, had conceived a categorical grant program to support the Great Society programs, which created a whole new level of government that was not elected, but rather appointed by the appointees who were largely Democrats. They were housing authorities and water and sewer authorities and airport authorities and taxi authorities and every sort of an authority you can imagine, and they would then be entitled to get grants directly from the federal government. The Nixon program was 180 degrees opposite. The Nixon program sought to reverse that by giving the money back to the state and local governments, but to the elected public officials, uh, which was consistent with my view of what was constitutional to begin with and was consistent with what I thought was the best method of governance. So I was completely in support of what the Nixon administration was proposing to do. Uh, and when I sought to do some things for the, uh, the, the, the authority I was the president of, uh, I was asked if I would come back and take a look at, at uh, how the revenue sharing program could be uh, implemented effectively, and, and I did, and was asked then to stay and was asked to, to uh, work on the revenue sharing program at the White House level, which I did and I agreed to do, and, and so in March of 71, I came back uh, and joined the White House staff on the Domestic Council and, and began to work primarily on the revenue sharing program from the beginning. But. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Johnson programs because we're going to talk about model cities in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things you mentioned is that, you know, there was a political aspect to the way President Johnson had designed this program. How would this work in practice? You know, how would President Johnson or the Johnson administration set this up? Well, I think the, the, the strategy of the Johnson administration was to, to, to create uh, entities that would be headed by people that would be appointed by Democrats, uh, strengthening the Democratic Party's control of governmental function uh, without the necessity of having an election. Uh, and the Republicans would have been, uh, had the Great Society steamrolled and had that steamroller built and snowballed. Uh, it's, it's my view that, that uh, without uh, something like revenue sharing and without the formula distribution programs of the Nixon administration, that this appointed level of government would have become the most important level of government and would have, have rendered the election process at the state and local level pretty much a, a non-event. Uh, so it was, while it was a brilliant strategy for entrenching the Democratic Party, it was a, I thought, disastrous strategy in terms of eliminating the role of elected public officials. Uh, the Nixon program ensured that public officials who got elected would have something to, resources to do something with. Uh, well, you're, you come on board in February 71, and in March of 71, uh, President Nixon begins issuing speeches and also written statements about both general revenue sharing and also a special revenue sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, what was revenue sharing? Revenue sharing was a program designed to return money to the states by formula. And that formula was a formula based on population, uh, based on need, uh, it, under the Johnson programs, the cities that were the most effective grantsmen, cities like San Diego, Tucson, Arizona, my home, uh, 
uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, were <clears throat> populated by people who were very effective grantsmen. Uh, and those cities got the lion's share of the good grants. Um, other cities, without the benefit of effective um, grantsmen, lobbyists, whatever you want to refer to them as, uh, were further down the chain in terms of likelihood of success in getting grants. Uh, so it's, it was a, a, an effort um, to even the playing field, to level the playing field and make sure that, that uh, on the basis of need as measured by population, uh, all cities would have a reasonably equal opportunity uh, to get federal dollars back. The special revenue sharing programs were in addition to general revenue sharing. And the special revenue sharing programs uh, were not directly my responsibility. Uh, I was responsible for general revenue sharing and for welfare reform, but the special revenue sharing programs were, uh, there were actually six. Uh, there were law enforcement, manpower, uh, health, um, uh, housing, community development, etc. And these, these special revenue sharing programs had a checkered career, essentially. Uh, two ultimately passed, uh, two failed, uh, and, and two struggled by getting converted into something else. Um, but uh, the general revenue sharing not only passed, uh, was a, a hallmark of the, the first term of the Nixon administration, um, and was uh, subsequently reenacted in the Ford administration. Um, and general revenue sharing proved to be a very effective program in giving money to the states, to the cities, the counties, and the Indian tribes uh, to spend as they desired but without any federal strings attached and without the necessity to uh, put together a magnificent grant application or a, um, hire a team of, of lobbyists to do it. Money was distributed by formula. Uh, and paid back three times a year, I believe. And this was to be done through the existing elected governments at the state and local level? Correct. Um, through the governors. At that time, the majority of the governors were Democrats. Uh, but the, the governors, as you mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, were particularly visible and particularly powerful group of people at that time. Uh, Governor Reagan in California was an extremely well-known governor and very strong. Governor Rockefeller in New York was a very strong and very out in front governor. Uh, in the South, governors like George Wallace uh, were, were uh, in fact, a, a presidential candidate who uh, suffered from an assassination attempt. Um, but the, the governors were, were, were very, very strong and the, and the mayors were very strong. There were very strong mayors like Dick Luger in Indianapolis, who became a senator, like Jake Garn in Salt Lake City, who became a senator. Um, there were numerous mayors like Frank Rizzo, who was a mayor in Philadelphia, uh, re-elected by huge margins every, every time. Frank Rizzo was, was a Democrat, but Frank Rizzo was a staunch Nixon supporter. And most of the mayors of major cities in the country and most of the governors were solidly behind the Nixon program. Now, where did the need for this revenue sharing come from? The need came from the struggles the states were, were, were having at that time to increase revenues without increasing property taxes. Um, the, the one thing that the, the states didn't want to have to do was increase property taxes. Most property taxes are levied by the lower level of government counties, uh, and they're lower. Uh, the, the, the tax uh, levy by counties uh, is approved by the states because the counties are generally an arm of the state. Um, but uh, it, it was the perception that property tax increases were going to be required across the country uh, if some other revenue source wasn't found for state government, uh, state and local government. And that's where revenue sharing came in. And now the 
Nixon Library has, of course, a California location, and next year it becomes the only location. So mm -hmm. we're familiar with Howard Jarvis and Prop 13. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this is the beginnings of that, of that movement. I think that's exactly right. I think that, that uh, the need to cap property taxes as, opposed, as, as uh, evidenced by Prop 13 uh, was becoming uh, a widespread around the country because people were finding that elderly people who had lived in their homes for many, many years were unable to continue to live in their homes because property taxes were driving them away. Uh, so people were having to sell their house in, in uh, the, their home state and move to another state uh, to avoid the property tax problem. Uh, and it was causing a shift in population. One program that you inherit, uh, that you're dealing with in your early years on the Domestic Council, uh, is something called Model Cities. And you have a variant of Model Cities, which I think you called Planned Variations. How did that work? The Planned Variation Program was a program that, that uh, we really developed at the Domestic Council uh, as a test bed for revenue sharing. Um, we asked the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development uh, and the Assistant Secretary for Community Development to come up with a means of, of testing in 20 cities the, the principles of general revenue sharing, to create, pick 20 cities around the country, include in it some of those great grantsmen like uh, San Diego and Tucson and Tampa, uh, but pick some of them that are not the great grantsmen. Pick some of the cities that, that uh, have struggled. Uh, and pick some of the cities that are, are uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, based on one particular population or one particular uh, economic group or one particular economic uh, base. Um, like a city in Michigan, for example, that uh, might be completely dependent on the auto industry. Um, so the 20 cities of diverse natures were picked and used for one quarter uh, as a test of the revenue sharing principle. And the 20 mayors that got the money were absolutely ecstatic and the, the program worked. Uh, and it did everything that the general revenue sharing was proposed to do uh, and became a uh, a basis for tremendous support in the Congress, uh, which helped revenue sharing pass and become enacted. Well, this leads us pretty naturally into a discussion of the 73 State of the Union. Um, set the stage for us. Why was the 73 State of the Union important? 73 State of the Union was absolutely critical because there were, there were two raging wildfires going on. Uh, we were having great difficulty getting anybody's attention on the domestic issue side. We, we, we had the, the revenue sharing program, which everybody loved. We had the welfare reform program, which we had tremendous democratic support for. Uh, the, the welfare reform program started out as priority number one, and the bill was actually H.R. 1. Uh, and H.R. 1 was... President Nixon's uh, number one target at, at, in 72. Uh, so we get to the 73 State of the Union, and we're struggling with welfare reform. Uh, we're, we're struggling, we're not struggling with revenue sharing. Everybody loves revenue sharing. Uh, but welfare reform, we're struggling not with the Democrats, but with Republicans. Uh, and Republicans were threatening not to go along with the president's program, and a different version of H.R. 1 came out of the Senate. So we were at an impasse and, and couldn't get H.R. 1 passed. No, but I just want to interrupt here. When we talk about welfare reform, what are the key planks of that? The key planks of welfare reform were to move people from welfare to work uh, and to, to try and break that cycle of poverty. Um, but to get people from the welfare rules in stages to a work environment. Uh, 
they tried all sorts of gimmicky names like workfare and, and other things to attract political support. But the truth was it was a staged means of moving people from welfare to work. Um, and at the time, as I said, we had Watergate, uh, we had uh, Vietnam, uh, we had those wildfires that were consuming all of everybody's uh, attention. Uh, and to get attention for the domestic program was, was very difficult. Planned variations helped us get mayor support from across the country. Uh, we got revenue sharing passed. Uh, we didn't get all the, the special revenue sharing bills passed, but we got a couple passed um, that also were necessary to support the welfare reform program. One was a manpower training program that would have buttressed welfare reform. Um, but uh, we, we were just unable to get enough attention um, congressionally uh, to, to get welfare reform passed. Well, I'm sure this seems as paradoxical now as it did then, but why were conservatives opposed to this? You know, I don't know that we ever really got the answer directly, uh, except that the conservatives were fearful that the welfare reform program was going to create a, a growing, out-of-control program, uh, that, that, that it would be a, a, a program that would require ever and ever more funding, uh, if, if any recession occurred, um, and uh, it's it conceivable that if a recession had occurred, it could have grown. Uh, it's also conceivable that if good times had occurred, which they did uh, economically, that it would have been less costly. Um, so it's um, difficult to predict what the economic course would have been uh, had welfare reform passed. But the conservatives were fearful that it would be a spending program out of control. Was there any debate on the White House staff about the benefits? There was, and there was concern at the White House level about the benefits and about capping the benefits. And we had taken every measure we could take that we could get Democratic support for uh, to cap benefits at, at uh, levels that would be predictable. Let's stop for a second. We're going to change tapes.